In 1996, California became the first state to legalize medical marijuana. Since then, 40 states and the District of Columbia have also legalized the use of cannabis for medicinal purposes. As well, the recreational or adult use of marijuana has also been approved by 21 states and the District of Columbia. In fact, according to Forbes, the global legal marijuana market is predicted to reach $43 billion by the end of 2025, an industry that has its roots in environmental stewardship and continues to battle social justice issues, the cannabis economy is being taken advantage of by a whole new generation of entrepreneurs. But like all thriving ecosystems, there was a generation of others who helped create the path to where we are now. I had the opportunity to interview someone who's been in the industry for quite some time. And full disclosure, I've also known Keith since we were in middle school. Welcome to another episode of Ripple on the Road. My name is Mike Shadroff. I am the founder and CEO of the Ripple Center, which is a 501c3 nonprofit organization. And we believe that industry has a lot to do with the social and environmental standards that we see in society. And our job is to help promote, to educate, to encourage other impact entrepreneurs, which brings me here today in California with Keith Hyatt, who is the owner of GK Manufacturing, as well as Ganja Juice. Correct. Thank you for having us here today, Keith. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for coming. So I want to start off with a, a basic question. Sure. Right? You're in the cannabis industry. Yes. And there's so much out there now with what's going on. You know, people hear CBD, THC, cannabinoids, all this stuff. Let's start off with like a basic vocabulary introduction as to sure what's going on and that that's actually a very valid statement there um, so yes as you were saying cannabis is quite a broad product okay um, the plant itself there's a male and a female and the hemp version of the plant is a male plant okay which is what is high in CBD and the other cannabinoids that we'll discuss kind of briefly in a minute and then there's the female sativa plant that is flowers, which is known as the THC plant. Um, from an eye, very difficult to tell the difference between them. Uh, there's some unique genetic characteristics that you can tell, but hemp also, the hemp plant also flowers and creates CBD bud, um, which is not really sought after until recently um, because of the lack of psychoactive effects that it, it has. But there's over 400 cannabinoids in the cannabis plant, and your body has a receptor for all of them. Wow. So with science, technology, and the evolution of the industry, you've been able to, we're able to extract individual isolates of CBD by itself, CBDA, CBG, CBN, and all of these different cannabinoids in and their own carry a benefit. So CBD, great for anxiety. CBN, great for anxiety. CBG, if you want to lose some weight, eat some CBG. You know, it's, it's, there's all these different benefits. There's THCP, THCO, THCA, all of these forms of THC that you never probably heard of that all bring the entourage effect to what you experience if you experience cannabis. Um, so THC as you know it, or weed as you know it, cannabis as you know it, is all of it. It's all of, comprised of all of the cannabinoids, 400 okay. cannabinoids, plus cannabinoids. Um, when you start isolating, you're, now you're 399 cannabinoids less, and you're really just one molecule or one compound. Those compounds, when combined with certain ingredients, can create other effects and other advantages or disadvantages. Um, depending on what you're trying to do. So um, being blessed in this industry and being able to talk to consumers and people on a, on a level of want and need. Want meaning this is what I want to feel like or this is what I want to happen and this is what I need it to happen, you know, how, how I need it to happen. 
um, is really what I work with. Um, so I started 16 years ago doing dispensary and selling cannabis over the counter to patients in California that had a medical recommendation. And 16 years ago, it was the wild, wild west. I had one law, well, two propositions, SB 420 and Senate Bill uh, 415 that allowed me to do what I was doing, but federally I was breaking the law. Okay. So as the industry started to grow, we started to see the needs from consumers and what they were looking for. Um, when you start dealing with clients that have Luke Erickson's disease, I had never heard of that until I got into the cannabis space. And Lou Gehrigson's disease is, uh, your body basically shuts down, slowly. So you eventually start to lose kidney function, liver function, lung function, heart function, brain function, all that just, your body just turning off one switch at a time. Mm. And it's sporadic. So a light switch turns off today doesn't mean you're done. It just means that don't work no more. And now your body's gonna, you know, something else is gonna turn off. So um, we had, I was privileged to meet uh, a lady who had Lou Gehrigson's disease, and she taught me how to see past cannabis. When I started using cannabis uh, for me, myself, when I knew that there was a medicinal benefit, was when I broke my back after high school, and I was smoking weed for my pain. Mm. So I don't take painkillers, I never did, never will. I'm not an opiate fan, I don't like that kind of stuff. Um, and I'm more of a natural, organic person. You know, I feel like, you know, 400 years ago there was no Pfizer. So what did they do 400 years ago when they were sick? And how did they treat themselves back then? Granted, life expectancy wasn't as long, but there were other factors aside from that. Um, but the, we were treating ourselves herbally and medicinally forever since the dawn of time. So, and what did we start with? So let's look at the basics and start with basics. So. When I learned that cannabis actually had a medicinal benefit for pain relief and allowed me at an early age to stay functioning and not have to go for surgeries and take all these opioids. And you know what? It was like, okay, gain a couple pounds because of the munchies and I giggle a lot, but I was really cool to be around too because I was in a better place mm. mentally. Um, so I, I realized at a very young age that there was a wellness to that, um, that allowed me to have a mental health wellness and a physical wellness that I would not normally have without the use of cannabis. But 40 years ago, you say that, people be like, you're nuts. You know, you're full, you don't know what you're talking about. There's no, no way cannabis is good for you. So it is, you know, I have my, my knowledge of what it did for me. Fast forward another 15 years later, I moved to California and I get exposed to the um, recre, not the recreational, but the um, cannabis community as it's exploding, as it's starting. Um, back in 96, California passed a law that basically allowed for the use of cannabis with uh, SB 420 and, and basically you couldn't sell it, but you could trade it and use it as, uh, you know, as a group in a group, and uh, you can become an association, if you will, of fellow users. And you guys can one guy can grow it, one guy can buy it, and the other guy uses it. You know. okay. So that's how the the structure of the industry started in California back in '96. Uh, a couple years later, it started to evolve into storefronts. And the cities were not happy. So the state was telling us, hey, you can do this. But the cities were like, nope, you can't. So how do we help people in an environment where we're being told we can't do what we're doing, we're, we're breaking the law, or we're doing something wrong? So we got an attorney and formed an association that allowed us to operate the way the state said we had to operate. And we took on the cities and just said, hey, you know what? We're here. This is what we're doing. If right. you want to pick a fight, we're, we're ready to fight. So uh, luckily, they were on our side for the most part and didn't really want to pick too many fights with us and allowed us to operate according to the state. 
And that's how I got to meet all of these wonderful people in this vast world of issues that I was never, ever exposed to. And I started to learn more. And I don't call them patients. I called them members because they were members of, of an association. But they treated me like I was a doctor because of the knowledge that I had of the cannabis plant and how it works. So there's an indica and a sativa genetic of a plant. And indica is formerly known as like what you would get when you smoke weed and get couch lock. You kind of just uh, mellow out. That's an indica, and a sativa is a little bit more energy, creativeness. You like your creative buttons are firing, okay. and uh, you know you're giggly, giggly, and munchies, and uh, life is good. Uh, that's a sativa, and then you have something in between called a hybrid, and it's a mash of the two. Sixteen years ago, there was hardly any hybrid. There was mainly indica or sativa. There wasn't a lot of cross genetics happening. As the years go on and the industry evolves, this, these cross-pollination and cross-genetics become so common, you, it's hard to find a true indica and a true sativa now. Everything's been crossed with so many different plants, and it's just everybody trying to make a name for themselves. However, the underlying benefit or non-benefit is, what does that plant do for you? So now it's not an indica straight, it's an indica with... 80% indica, 20% sativa genetics, well, now I'm getting a different effect than I would before. So pain management is a little easier. Anxiety management, a little easier to do now with these hybrids and these genetics, um, as well as the uh, advancement of, of the edibles. Mm. The edibles is a market that is so vast and large because of the way they operate. I personally am not a fan of edibles as an ingest, and you know, when you ingest it, you have no control. If I'm smoking, oh, I'm high, stop, put it down, walk away. Mm. When I take an edible, oh, I feel it. Oh, it's not stopping. Oh, how do you make this go away? Uh, which is a common occurrence with people that take edibles is how do you know how to, um, adjust and moderate your intake. So I kind of digress a little bit, but back to our member who had Lou Gehrigson's disease. She came in as a smoker of cannabis and left as an edible user. So as she started to deteriorate, she couldn't ingest it anymore. Her daughter was a nurse in Ohio who was coming out to take care of her and was like, hey, do you guys have something that's not a brownie or a cookie or a Rice Krispie treat? Back then, it was Rice Krispie Treat, brownie, cookie, or double dip chocolate bar. That was it. That's the only way you could get cannabis in food. Mm. Um, there was no other um, ways to do it. They had a tincture, which is called Rick Simpson oil, and it's an oil-based tincture. Um, but it's really just alcohol and weed soaked in alcohol, and then you just drop that in. Okay. So um, it's pure cannabis, but and it's a full-spectrum product, but it's still different. Um, the way you, you ingest it and the way your body reacts to it uh, is different than if you were to smoke it. So uh, this young lady, she wasn't really young, but this woman who was sick and dying needed a new form of, uh, a new vehicle to get her medicine. Started researching how does cannabis affect you? How does it get into your system? And that's when I learned you know, you need a fat, a salt, or a sodium, or um, sulfur mm. to get it into your body, a vehicle. Um, inhalation of smoke goes into your bloodstream, and hence why you feel the effects pretty quickly. But when you eat it, your body breaks it down. It goes through your kidney and your liver first, and then into your bloodstream. So there's a, a bunch of it that gets wasted and not utilized, and then there's what does, what's available that gets used, and how does that work? So knowing that there was nothing on the market that existed that allowed somebody to get cannabis into their system in a healthy manner um, was a mission that I had self taken on because this poor woman, I couldn't stand to see her suffer. And, um, you know, she had taught me a lot. So I figured the least I can do is 
try and help. So I started playing in the lab and this launched to where we are today. So I had created a smoothie that we could get cannabis into. And you say, well, how do you get weed into a smoothie without dropping weed into a smoothie and then having all this clumpy stuff in your mouth um, and make it taste good? So we started researching and I found that well, I had a, a unique blend of avocado, hemp, and flaxseed oil. Those three oils were high in omegas, mm. fats, which are very good binders for cannabis. So I was able to extract the cannabis into that blended oil and then use that oil as a shot into the smoothie. And that's how this, all of this started to, to expand. So we quickly realized that there's a lot more you can do now having this little oil. Well, now I can put it on popcorn. You know, I don't have to just do weed butter. Uh, I don't, weed butter is fin finicky. If too hot, you ruin it, tastes weird. If it's too cold, you don't get enough extraction out of it, it's not mm -hmm. strong enough. So it becomes a very finite line to, to mess with. But and is that what was being used initially in yeah, all butter. those other treats? Yeah, yeah, it was just butter. Okay. Well, no, they had, the drinks, there was no drinks at the time. Because uh, at the time, cannabis was only in one form, okay. the flower form. And you had to break it down into an oil form. And that wasn't really being done by a lot of people back then. Gotcha. Because it was easy to sell the, you know, the everything else. Butter was the only way. Right. You know, that was the thing. So uh, we had to come up with something different. So we did. We, we created this healthy oil blend that had great bioavailability and was actually good for you. Mm. So we were like, hey, we, we've got a product here. We think it might work. So we started making it exclusively for this woman at our shop. I went and bought a blender, bought some fresh fruit, kept it in the refrigerator with some juice. And when she would show up, I would pull out the everything out of the refrigerator, pull the, the blender out, put it on the counter, and I'd just make it right in front of her. And I'd pour the shot in so she could see what was being done. Uh, because for me, with her health, it, was, it needed to be as transparent as possible. So she understood what was happening in case her doctors wanted to know or if anybody wanted to know what was happening. We wanted that, that you know, fluency and the... Um, efficacy of what we were doing to be shown to her so she could understand and her daughter. Mm -hmm. um, so other customers at the time were like, hey, what's that? Well, I want that. I want that. And like an idiot, I'm like, no, it's for sick people. <laughs> you know, but everybody coming in is sick, you know, essentially. But, uh, you know, I, I, was, uh, I was holding back on letting other people have it. Sure. Because I didn't really know what we were doing yet. And needed to see if there was a benefit. So with a little bit of feedback from her, uh, from this woman and her daughter, we were able to dial in the potency right. Now this is pre-lab testing. Uh, 16 years ago, there was no labs out there testing anything. Mm. So, which now encourages me to find a lab. Because I gotta start testing this stuff. Because I gotta know. Sure. So we find a lab, we start testing, and we start, once we started testing, that changed the game for everything and how we operated. We then hired a formulator from Revlon and they helped us create the now over 400 SKUs we can make in product. And what that did was bring a raw material into products like even water-based, because THC is not water-soluble. Mm. So how do you make a non-water-soluble product water-soluble without it floating and separating? and uh, well, we learned that if we can infuse sugar or salt with THC, it'll dissolve and it leaves a very minor film of residue compared to just throwing THC into it. Okay. So we created, started creating these methodologies and processes that now today we use every day, all day to create these products and get them into the, get them into the, into the various different products we make whether it's transdermal or absorbing it or eating it or smoking it. We want to make sure that it's healthy, it's correct, and you're getting the right amount. Because anybody can put anything in anything. That's not a, a secret. But it's can you do it right? And that's what we've kind of built our foundation off of. Um, it's, it's our responsibility. I feel it's 
personally my responsibility to make sure that if you take one of our products, it's going to work and it's going to be good for you. It's not going to hurt you, whether it be health wise. So that's a that's a question then I have because you started off you talked about the fact that it was at first you're you're abiding by the state regulations right and mm -hmm. the federal and still to this day right oh yeah Federal's federally it's no bueno it's a crime yeah yeah we're breaking the law despite the fact that two thirds of I believe the states have some form of medicinal or or recreational, recreational uh, marijuana. I want to ask you, so what's interesting, you actually studied criminal justice. Correct. So you have a unique perspective on doing this. Where does, I'm going to ask you kind of a few questions and let you take it away. Where does number one, with the federal, um, you know, illegality, I'll call it, of this product, where does that fit into your, what you need to know legally? Where does the FDA fit into this, if at all? And how do you, what you were saying is put the onus of, um, you know, putting out a product that's actually healthy and good and, and legitimate to your clients. Is there any oversight to that or does it really fall on you? So. That was a lot, but. No, no, it's all great questions. Um, and it's, it's, they all actually tie into each other. So it's, it's a phenomenal question. We'll start with the legalities, the first question. Yes, I did go to school for criminal justice, excuse me, police science. And that is why my attorney thinks I'm not in jail, <laughs> is because I have that mindset of um, what, it's not what can I do. Well, the question I asked my attorney when I met him for the first time was, tell me what I can't do. Mm. I don't want to know about what I can't, I want to know what can't I not do. Give me the don't do this list. And that's how I entered the, the, the industry with what can I not do. And he told me I was the only person that had ever asked him that question. And in fact, he thought for years in the beginning that I was an attorney myself because of the ability to have that uh, intellectual conversation about legalities and how to navigate. I don't want to say skirt and break or bend or whatever, but just navigate. Federal government has legalized cannabis three times in the history of the United States, uh, from 1800s to today. Um, it is close to being legalized for the fourth time. The stance since Obama's reign in, in moving past that has been, um, if the states want it, we're hands off. We're not gonna waste taxpayer money going after states trying to shut this down when the states want it. So that was the first wink, nod, nudge from the government that says, hey, look, you guys, you know, you should be okay. And, and I say that loosely because there's no guarantee that you're protected under any law that says you're okay to do this. If the government decides they don't like what you're doing today, they can stop you and shut you down and, and criminally charge you. And that is something that risk and reward that you think about. Is this worth the risk? And is the reward worth it? And not even from a monetary standpoint, but from a, a life, seeing the improvement in the lives around the life around you, and how people benefit. I'll take that risk any day. It's beyond money, beyond all of that. It's the quality of life that you can bring somebody mm. from a natural plant. I will fight till my death that I'm right on that and I stand behind that and that's the main reason why I I planted my feet and stayed where I was staying in this because I feel that in my heart the reasons behind this are the right reasons it's not anyone's fault you get sick but why do we have to rely on a pill or something synthetically made and I've never once used cannabis for something and then had to take something else because I used cannabis. Where when I take a over-the-counter product, I'm prescribed this pill and then I gotta take this one and then I gotta take that one to counteract all the side effects and all these crazy things that can happen, let alone death if I overdose. Mm. You know, like that's a huge fear. Um, I, I, I'm an indulgent person so if I feel good from a pill, I might as well take more, you know? And that, that was my fear why I never took pills. 
because I, I was afraid I might like how I feel and now I'm, now I'm an addict and now I'm in a whole new arena of life that I didn't want to be in. And I'm not that way with cannabis. I'm not hooked into an arena of addiction and I need treatment for um, you know, my use of cannabis, which people, I get into arguments with people constantly about being an addict to cannabis. And I tell them, I can stop smoking marijuana today. Nothing will happen. I won't withdraw. I won't freak out. I won't lose my mind. I won't get sick. None of that's going to happen. You know what's going to happen? My back's going to hurt. I'm going to get cranky as fuck because I'm in pain. It's all good. Uh, I'm going to be cranky because I'm in pain. And I'm not going to be as relaxed as I was when I'm smoking cannabis. That's the only difference. So if that's bad, okay, I'll be bad. <laughs> I'll take the bad road. Now, federally, the government is slowly coming around uh, to legalization again. They have a new bill that's been passed into the Senate. The House needs to sign off on it. Um, we're curious to see if that happens this year or next year. Uh, but it's very close to coming to a federal legalization. That being said, the FDA has um, a, a different stance. The FDA has to make a decision on whether or not cannabis is medicine mm. before they can kind of rule about how this works. So I went to the stakeholders meeting back in 2018 at, at the FDA. They were talking about how does this work? Is it considered to be, because you have GW Pharmaceuticals who has made a synthetic THC product they make a pill that is um, the exact synthetic structure of cannabis, has the same effect, but it's in a pill form. It's a white pill. It has no actual raw, natural THC in it. That's dumb. Why would you want to make a product that already exists naturally that your body's built to receive? Why? Why would you want to take that? Makes no sense. And I couldn't understand that. Then you got the agricultural side of the industry, the hemp side, who says, hey, this hemp is like phenomenal for my horses, my chickens, my cows, because we grow the hemp and we feed them the, the byproduct of what's left after we don't use, whatever we don't use, that's what we feed the animals. And they're healthier, less disease. Um, they seem to be a better, a better fit for human consumption than what we're doing now. Mm. So you have... A product that is, from an FDA standpoint, is good and beneficial and to the animals, the agriculture, and to human consumption. And then you have the pharmaceutical side where they've made a synthetic drug. And if they can get the government to legalize THC again, they will have a monopoly on the cannabis market. Because now you can't put it into food and drink because you can't mix food and drugs. And if they classify it as a drug, they eliminate an edible market altogether. It goes back to the black market. So you're telling me I either have to take a pill or smoke it. Which smoking can be bad for certain people with lung and respiratory issues, asthma. Well, they don't want to smoke weed, so they have to ingest it a different way. Well, now they have to take a synthetic pill? That's not right. That's not how, that's not how God put this on the planet. This plant showed up naturally. If, if it's a natural... Weed or fungi, it's for me. You know, it's, it's okay. I understand there's berries that'll kill me. I also understand there's buds that'll heal me. So there's both the benefits of both. And that's how do you utilize them and how do you work with them. The government just gets in the way because of the taxation. And I understand that. You don't want your, your people growing their own medicine. Well, if I can grow my own plant, put it in a window and take care of my glaucoma treat my cancer, treat my pain, my anxiety, all of these various ailments, you know, inflammation, all of these different things. I can create that myself. What do I need big pharma for? You know, and, and, and live a natural quality, a, a healthy quality of life. I'm not saying like weed is the answer. It's not. I mean, it's not an answer for my broken back. I'm not like, oh my God, look, I can do cartwheels. But you know what? I can get out of bed. And I can function every day without a, a barbiturate mm. or, or a narcotic, a heavy narcotic. And I'm not addicted to a, a drug that 
you know, numbs me to the world. Weed numbs me, but not like that. It makes me a fun guy, you know, tolerable, and it makes me forget about my pain. So for me, it's a hard sell to go the other way and to not do what I'm doing. And I feel like if, it, if I don't do it, who else is going to? Who's going to fight for me? Big Pharma? No. The government? No. No one. So I feel like, you know, I represent everyone else in that fashion that, you know, we're here. It's our body, our choice, and it's how we want to deal with what we're dealing with. Everybody has them, you know, something. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like some people can't drink coffee or tea because of the caffeine. Other people need caffeine. There's, everybody's different. Who am I to tell you, oh, you shouldn't do that? It's, it's a natural plant. Right. My fear that I have to worry about with uh, cannabis overdose is the worst. This is the worst case. Death is not on the, on the list. Diarrhea. I've had that before. Sleepiness. Could use a nap. You know, or slight irritability in your stomach if you ingest too much. From, from the stomach. That's the side effects we're talking about. If you listen to the side effect list on any commercial on TV, diarrhea is always number one, whether it's a rash cream or an eye cream or whatever, an eye drop. But they're, the list and death is at the end, always. Always consult the doctor. Always do, like, I mean, there's, there's only one drug that cannabis has a reaction with, and that's a blood thinner. So if you have heart problems, and a specific heart problem with specific blood pressure problem, you should consult the physician when taking cannabis because that could create some, what it does is it actually creates a delay mm. in your medicine. So that type of medicine that's needed, it's not a barbiturate, it's a blood pressure pill. I understand, you know, nitrogen and, and you need all of that. Um, so I, I respect that boundary there, but I can take an opioid and smoke a joint and there's no interaction. The channels of cro crossing aren't there. Same with mushrooms. Um, mushrooms, the psilocybin, your body is meant to receive. It's great for anxiety, pain, and uh, headaches, mm. migraines. So a lot of people are seeing, which I think you're gonna start to see over the next four to five years are these infused cross genetic products. Uh, as mushrooms become legal and more legalized, like here in California, they just decriminalized it. Uh, Colorado's decriminalized it. So the wave is moving now on, on the, the fungus side, um, which cracks me up because uh, from the law enforcement side, police officers don't know the difference between civil silas and lion's mane. You could have a bag of lion's mane, they don't know what it is. And there's not a lab on the planet that can test for it yet. Other than, uh, um, there is one lab. Uh, in LA. It's in UCLA. And the government won't allow them to do testing for Sybil Silas on any products because they're governmentally funded. So they're the only lab that can test and no one else can. So the government doesn't even know what's in it, what. You know, they wouldn't know. So the idea of knowing like, oh, this is penis envy or ang blue meanies or lion's mane or reishi, you wouldn't know the difference. Uh, unless you were a mushroom expert. Right. So law enforcement's not looking for it from a, a standpoint of legalities. You, you got a couple mushrooms in your pocket. They don't know what the fuck that is. So, so from an impact, right, because we're talking about impact and well, yeah. entrepreneurship here, yeah. right, you've, you've mentioned stuff on the social end, especially as a, as a medicine. Mm -hmm. um, you've talked about the fact that, you know, cannabis is a natural plant, can be grown organically, all this. You've just made mention of kind of the criminal justice piece of it. How has the expansion of the industry assisted with over-incarcerating individuals? Like, can you speak to that at all? How you, yeah. like some of your clients or things that they've had to well, deal with? I, or... I, have a, I have friends in the business that are never going to see the light of day because of the industry. And we're all doing the same thing. And what makes what I'm doing better than them or vice versa. And the way it really boils down to it's, it's how you handle 
the responsibility that you have with this market. Um, being in this space, um, you know, you can look at it two ways. My parents were disconnected. I was a drug dealer in their eyes. You know, I was doing an illegal mm. business and I was selling an, an illegal drug. You can't spell it any other way to them. To see that evolution over the 16 years and to see how their attitudes changed from their son being a drug dealer to now their son working in a space that is gray and borderline illegal. It's, it's funny to hear them discuss that. Um, to, see, to say, oh, now it's not so bad. Um, the industry has changed. It has changed tremendously. I think the awareness of cannabis and the awareness of the effects and also the awareness of the fact that there are no real major effects on the negative side is, I think, a huge plus um, for, for the space and how people perceive it and how people utilize it. I do believe that there needs to be regulations, controls, and um, uh, fail-safes in this business to make sure that people are doing things properly and that people don't get hurt. I was lab testing, like I said, 14 years ago. I was spending $300 a test to get a product tested. And we're talking about stuff that never even made the light of day, dropping 300 bucks to test it. As my farmers would come in, the growers were never testing their product. Mm -hmm. We started testing it and saying, hey, check it out. This is how we're gonna buy the cannabis from you. If it tests out at this percentage to this percentage, we're gonna pay you X amount. If it tests out between this percentage and this percentage, we're gonna pay X amount. And we set, we set the standard to our vendors which who then in turn realized, oh, if I grow a better product, they're gonna pay me more. More than what the industry standard for the pound was, and the going rate for a pound back in the day was $3,800 a pound. If you grew good stuff, I'd pay you 42. You, so you're gonna take it to a shop that's gonna give you 38, or you can bring it to me and get 42. So I had everybody bringing me all the best stuff on the planet in California back in the day. I had farms coming from Emerald Triangle down to meet down here to meet with us to get us on their 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 plan because they wanted to sell us their products. So for for people that are watching that you know still are saying to themselves but it's still a drug, right? This is a drug. Like what and you're saying this is going to be now the fourth time, right, that mm -hmm. this is going to be legalized. What are the biggest misconceptions? Like where is that you know, the vilification of marijuana that has happened over time. Like, why is it still stuck with people? Or what is it that you would say to... Henry Anslinger is the reason why. Um, reefer Madness. The last push for prohibition of cannabis was probably one of the best ad campaigns ever created to this day. And it still used the techniques that they used then to create reefer madness and the fear of. Um, in the 60s, they painted it, if you smoked weed, you were either black and you were gonna rape white women. I wanna talk about racist. The whole concept of the, of the campaign was built off of racism and fear. Hmm. Two things that American consume. Sidestep to your, your, to your question of, you know, is this a drug? What constitutes a drug? You know, I mean, the drug in itself isn't a bad word, but it can be used in a bad word, mm -hmm. as a bad word, or it can be used as a positive. You know, oh, I'm gonna prescribe you some prescription drugs that are gonna help. That's not bad. Oh, you take drugs, you're a drug addict. That's bad, you know? So very quickly that word can be tweaked to, to, to in context to be used positively or negatively. So I don't, classify it as a drug it's a treatment because it's something that your body can receive and accept and it doesn't last forever meaning it doesn't eliminate a problem i will fight for everybody including myself to earn the right it's my body my choice like i understand um cannabis isn't a cure-all but Man, it works for a lot of stuff. Like, there's a lot of benefit. And not only that, but the byproduct from it, I can make a shirt, some rope, 
some fabric, you know, like, like talk about an impact. You're 100%, 100% of the product is being used. I don't throw away any part of the plant, whether it's a leaf, a stem, a stick, it doesn't matter. It's all valuable mm. for the benefit of what we do. Now, speaking of, I want to make sure we also give a shout out to the manufacturing end of what you're doing. You're in a facility. Yes. Right. That is, I believe, FDA certified. We're it FDA registered. Halal and kosher. We're in the process of halal and kosher. Okay. Uh, we are FDA registered. Uh, we're uh, CGMP. We're S we have uh, SOPs for our procedures and we have... Uh, an ISO certification. Okay, so what happens here in the manufacturing facility? So, every day is different here. Um, we do everything from topicals, drinks, gummies, chocolates. So, sometimes there's food, sometimes there's topicals. So, how do you do all of that without cross-contaminating and getting one thing into another? Uh, you know, we have products with heavy menthol smell. That'll get in, leach into other products and drinks if you do you think so? Uh, we, we schedule everything on a very tight schedule. So our schedule, when we run a job, it has to get done. And I just want to be clear, these aren't necessarily your products. No, not okay. all of them. Uh, we white label, co-pack, co and manufacture for other clients. We do formulation for other clients. Um, we are probably in about 15% of the products that are out there we are, are, are ours. Okay. Um, doesn't sound like a lot, but this industry is huge. So it is quite a bit. Uh, we touch a lot of different products for a lot of different brands. Uh, with and without CBD and THC and all the cannabinoids. Um, we also deal with kava and kratom. Uh, we do anything holistically herbal is what we focus on. Um, the legalities of it is not my problem. I'm not here to fight with legalities. That's someone else's job. My job is to create quality products mm -hmm. that work. So I don't fight the law. I, you know, I, I, I don't want to discourage and, and tell people, oh, F the law. But laws aren't necessarily created for all good. Um, there are some dumb laws. And I think this is one of them. You know, when it comes to natural uh, remedies, I, I feel like there's... There, there's no reason for the government to be involved in that. Um, that's between, you know, you and your doctor, you and your your significant other, or your family to make those decisions. It's no one else's business. I don't judge you for treating with a barbiturate versus treating with a natural herb. I don't care. Mm. If you're happy, I'm happy. You know, if you're healthy, then I then that's great. That's all that matters. It's how you feel at the end of the day. So if I live my life in this industry with the law being a factor, I would never be where I'm at today. Um, I don't thumb my nose at the law and say, fuck you, but I kind of do. Kind of say, hey, this isn't your arena. You know, we're not here hurting people. Take it somewhere else. Um, so that mentality has kept me in it for as long as I've been in it and kept me growing and pushing and, you know, uh, exploring what these, what the benefits are to this, but it's definitely, um, changing to the, to the point of now you're going to start to see like the government doesn't care if they care, they would be shutting it down. You know, you know how hard it is to put toothpaste back in a toothpaste container? I mean, they squeeze the two too tight, you know, it's, it's, it's out there. Like you said, it's more than 60% of the population in the United States has either legalized or decriminalized cannabis, whether it be for medicinal and or recreational. That's more than half of the, the population. We used to have a law on the books, which they had changed because of this, mm -hmm. that if it was 50% uh, or more of the states, if they all adopted a law, the government would change the law because it's, they work for the people. Well, they didn't do that. And the reason why they didn't do that, again, it comes back to the control. How do we control this? How do we monetize this? And if the FDA and the government can't make money on it, you can't. So that's why this is a, a um, let, let's be real. The battle with cannabis and, 
and um, herbal remedies, kava, kratom, and mushrooms alike, isn't because people can get hurt. That's not the case. So your well-being is not the reason why. The, the main reason why is how do I tax that? How do I make you pay me for taking that? Mm. And if they can't do that, I can grow a mushroom in my, in my house. I can grow a plant in my closet. I don't need the government to approve. Well, how, they, they can't collect that tax. Right. So that's why this is a problem. Well, the states have shown that they can collect a tax and that they can, they can track it from seed to sale. So they've shown the government that this is an easily tracked product, alcohol. We'll step back to that, same thing. I mean, they know there's moonshine, but I mean, when's the last moonshine raid you've heard of? Never. It's been a while. Right, never. They don't, you don't hear about that. Just like you don't really hear about the cannabis raids anymore. The government isn't gonna spend its money chasing this when they realize it's going to an end. Mm. You know, there's a, there's a means to the end. Um, I don't agree with decriminalizing all narcotics, all drugs. Um, I don't think cocaine should be legal, heroin, none of that. Should, I don't agree with that. Those are synthetically made. Although cocaine does come from a coca plant, but it's processed with chemicals to, to turn it into something else. I'm not a huge fan of that. Um, I do believe in that there's a health benefit to the coca leaf and that if you chew it, it, there's some remedies to that. And I'm okay with that. But I don't think that it should be done in the manner that it's being done and made the way it's being made. So I'm not pro cocaine, but I'm pro cocoa plant, coca plant. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I'm I'm pro anything that's good for you naturally. And I think a lot of people take that same stance, whether they're vocal about it or whether they're willing to put their nuts on the line to do it. That's a whole nother story. But I do think that there's a lot more like-minded people like me. And that's why this industry is where it's at today. Uh, it, it's not because of me. It's because of the people that use the end product. Sure. And, you know, continue to use the end product. Let me ask you, because this is, you know, you are part of a disruption of industry, which is great. Final thoughts, you know, what, what are your hopes? What do you see um, this industry turning into, you know, in the next few years or let alone decades? Well, like, to be honest... To where it's going is a mess. Legalization has just been a nightmare for this industry. Um, what should be done and what won't be done, like what I'd like to see is, just, if it's organic, leave it alone. Just leave it alone, don't, it's not a drug, it's not, don't classify, just leave it alone. But that's not gonna be, that's not our reality. So I would like to see um, the government accept it for what it is, Treat it like it is, mm -hmm. what it is. Treat it for what it is. And uh, I, I, I love that people are starting to get released and starting to, you know, overturn draw these, these cannabis cases and stuff. Uh, I, I, you know, I know a few people that are in trouble and they're, some of them are getting out in the near future because of these new laws and the way things are changing. So I think we're in the right direction. I don't think it's the best direction, but it's better than what it was before. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I think the next four to five years, it's gonna be a little tumult, uh, tumultuous, but it's gonna settle down. And I think, you know, by the time our kids are old enough to, to be adults, their conversation about cannabis is gonna be a lot different than ours um, and how it's being treated. Um, and I also think that it's great that the stigma of cannabis use is being taken away. Um, I, I truly hate that people think, oh, you smoke weed, you're a stoner, you're, you're a loser, you're, you don't know anything. <laughs> I laugh when I hear that. Like, you're, you're right, I'm a stoner, I'm an idiot. <laughs> Look at me, a dumb idiot. Um, so I, I do respect that, you know, like I think that that needs to, to change a little bit and I think it is for the, for the positive overall. I think that, um, Cannabis's rap is is finally starting to break, and reefer madness is finally starting to end. Nice timing. <laughs> Perfect. Well, we still have this one. So oh, good. On that note, thank you for the education. Yeah. Of the industry, and you my know, pleasure. Wish you well for the for the stuff that you're providing to right. uh, members. Thank you for uh, stopping by. It was a pleasure. You got it.